Hey, and welcome back to The Hobbit, and not lunch today, uh, like yesterday with the Norwegian session, uh, I've kind of gone away from lunch and literature, and it's now become milk, dessert, and literature, so I found that it's easier to read while Anna is having her after lunch milk in a cup, sipping up, uh, then when she eats. She's starting to, uh, well, she needs some refills, and as always, she makes quite a mess, and uh, she's also quite vocal. So it's just better this way. When she has a cup in her mouth and enjoys the reading more, I think. And uh, also, another change is that this is no longer a stream, it's a recording that I'm uploading to YouTube after the fact. I think that's how most of you uh, who listen to this uh, listen to it anyway, as a recording. So I don't think that's going to make a big change. We are going to have a not very long reading session today because we almost finished the chapter A Short Rest last time. Uh, that's where they've come to the last homely house where Elrond lives. Uh, and we will try to finish that chapter today. Uh, before we do though, Anna just finished her first cup of milk and she probably wants a second, so I'll do that before we crack at it. Yeah. No, no, stay in there, Anna. I'll give you a refill. Are you going for the computer? Do mm -hmm. you think we need, some ch need to change some settings? Set things. Set things, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Set. Important to get that right, right? Right, right. Okay, cup is back in Anna's mouth, and there I've repositioned myself, and Bilbo was just thinking about how elves know a lot and are wondrous folk for news, and know what is going on among the peoples of the land as quick as water flows or quicker. But the dwarves were all for supper, as soon as possible, just then, and would not stay. On they all went, leading their ponies, till they were brought to a good path, and so at last to the very brink of the river. It was flowing fast and noisily, as mountain streams do of a summer evening, when sun has been all day on the snow far up above. There was only a narrow bridge of stone without a parapet, as narrow as a pony could walk well on, and over that they had to go, slow and careful, one by one, each leading his pony by the bridle. The elves had brought bright lanterns to the shore, and they sang a merry song as the party went across. Don't dip your beard in the foam, father, they cried to Thorin. When he You're very, uh, very noisy over there. Um, they cried to Thorin, where, who was bent almost to his hands and knees. It is long enough without watering it. Mind Bilbo. Mind Bilbo doesn't eat all the cakes, they called. He is too fat to get through keyholes yet. Hush, hush, good people, and good night, said Gandalf. Who came last. Valleys have ears and some elves have over merry tongues. Good night. And so at last they all came to the last homely house and found its doors flung wide. Now it is a strange thing but things that are good to have 
and days that are good to spend are soon told about, and not much to listen to, while things that are uncomfortable, uh, palpitating and even gruesome, may make a good tale, and take a deal of telling anyway. They stay long in that good house, fourteen days at least, and they found it hard to leave. Bilbo would gladly have stopped there forever and ever, even supposing a wish would have taken him right back to his hobbit hole without trouble. Yet there is little to tell about their stay. The master of the house was an elf friend, one of those people whose fathers came into the strange stories before the beginning of history. The wars of the evil goblins and the elves and the first men in the north. In those days of our tale, there were still some people who had both elven and heroes of the north for ancestors, and Elrond, the master of the house, was their chief. He was as noble and as fair in face as an elf lord, as strong as a warrior, as wise as a wizard, as venerable as a king of dwarves, and as kind as summer. He comes into many tales, but his part in the story of Bilbo's great adventure is only a small one, though important, as you will see, if we ever get to the end of it. His house was perfect. Whether you liked food, or sleep, or work, or storytelling, or singing, or just sitting and thinking best, or a pleasant mixture, mixture of them all, evil things did not come into that valley. I wish I had time to tell you even a few of the tales, or one or two of the songs that I heard in the house. All of them, the ponies as well, grew refreshed and strong in the few days there. Their clothes were mended as well as their bruises, their tempers, and their hopes. Their bags were filled with food and provisions, light to carry but strong to bring them over the mountain passes. Their plans were improved with the best advice. So the time came to Midsummer Eve, and they were to go on again with the early sun of Midsummer Morning. Elrond knew all about runes of every kind. That day he looked at the Zord, swords they had brought from the Troll Slayer, and he said, These are not troll make. They are old swords, very old swords of the High Elves of the West, my kin. <laughs> They were made in Gondolin for the Goblin Wars. They must have come from a dragon's horde or goblin plunder, for dragons and goblins destroyed that city many ages ago. This Thorin, the runes name Orchrist, the Goblin Cleaver, in the uh, ancient tongue of Gondolin, it was a famous blade. This Gandalf was Glamdring, foe hammer that the king of Gondolin once wore, keep them well. Whence did the trolls get them, I wonder, said Thorin, looking at his sword with new interest. I could not say, said Elrond, but one may guess that your trolls had plundered other plunderers, or come on the remnants of old robberies in some hold in the mountains. I have heard that there are still forgotten treasures of old to be found in the desert, deserted caverns of the mines of Moria since the dwarves and goblin war since the dwarf and goblin war thorin pondered these words i will keep this sword in honor he said may it soon cleave goblins once again a wish that is likely to be granted soon enough in the mountains said elrond but show me now your map he took it and gazed long at it and he shook his head for if he did not altogether approve of dwarves and their love of gold, he hated dragons and their cruel wickedness, and he grieved to remember the ruin of the town of Dale and its merry bells and the burned banks of the bright river running. The moon was shining in a broad silver crescent. He held up the map and the white light shone through it. What is this? he said. There are moon letters here. Beside the plain runes, which say, five feet high the door and three may walk abreast. What are moon letters? asked the hobbit, full of excitement. He loved maps, 
as I have told you before, and he also liked runes and letters and cunning handwriting, though when he wrote himself it was a bit, it was a bit thin and spidery. Moon letters are rune letters, but you cannot see them, said Elrond. Not when you look straight at them. They can only be seen when the moon shines behind them. And what is more, with the more cunning sort, it must be the moon of the same shape and season as the day when they were written. The dwarves invented them and wrote them with silver pens, as your friends could tell you. These must have been written on a midsummer's eve in a crescent moon a long while ago. What do they say? asked Gandalf and Thorin together. A bit wexed, perhaps, even Elrond should have found this out first, though really there had not been a chance before, and there would not have been another until goodness knows when. Stand by the grey stone when the trush knocks, read Elrond, and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. Durin, Durin, said Thorin. He was the father of the fathers of the eldest race of dwarves, the Longbeards, and my first ancestor. I am his heir. Then what is Durin's day? asked Alran. The first day of the dwarves' new year, said Thorin. It, as all should know, is, as all should know, the first day of the last moon of autumn on the threshold of winter. We still call it Durin's Day, when the last moon of autumn and the sun are in the sky together. But this will not help us much, I fear, for it passes our skill in these days to guess when such a time will come again. That remains to be seen, said Gandalf. Is there any more writing? None to be seen by this moon, said Elrond, and he gave the map back to Thorin. And then they went down to the water to see the elves dance and sing upon the Midsummer's Eve. The next morning was a Midsummer morning as fair and fresh as could be dreamed. Blue sky and never a cloud, and the sun danced on the water. Now they rode away amid songs of farewell and good speed, with their hearts ready for more adventure, and with a knowledge of the road they must follow over the misty mountains to the land beyond. That was the end of chapter three, and we will stop there. Anna is playing and almost done with her second serving of milk. Are you going to finish up before bedtime, Anna? Time. Yeah? Maybe. Let's say bye. Bye. No? You don't want to? Okay. Well... I say bye, and for tomorrow there will be more Norwegian, and then hopefully, if uh, everything goes to plan and nothing unplanned comes up, there should be more Hobbit on Thursday. And, actually, before I say the final goodbye for the day, I have another thing I want to mention, and that is if you are a fan of good storytelling, and you presumably are since you're listening to The Hobbit. I have started a new series on YouTube where I'm playing through the now 20-year-old game DSX, which is a masterpiece of video game storytelling. It's a bit of a different media than a book, uh, for those of you who might listen to this but have never played through a story-driven computer game. Uh, now you don't have to play it yourself if you're not a fan. You can sit down or lay down or however you like it and watch it as a movie. And I highly recommend that game, whether you play it yourself or you watch me play. Or you can watch others play too if you don't like how I do it. Uh, there are already playthroughs on uh, YouTube. Um, but that's my second little project going on right now. Uh, check it out. It's on my channel uh, somewhere. Shouldn't be too hard to find. So, hey, then me, it's me, me. bedtime. Mimi? No, we're not watching Mimi now. Sorry. Mm. Bye.